الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم بخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Brother Chairman, uh, our distinguished guests who have come from abroad, uh, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We have with us Brother Abdul Qadir from Greece, uh, Athens in Greece, who was Orthodox Christian and took the Shahada, became Muslim, and he's with us here. He just arrived last night, and uh, he is preparing the way for me to visit Greece <laughs> later this year, inshallah. Brother Abdul Qadir, stand up so they can see you. Yes. <laughs> and we have another brother from Britain, from Pakistan, yeah, Brother Rana, who is also here with us, uh, and also arrived yesterday. Um, so we welcome them. And we welcome you to this lecture on uh, nuclear war, which is coming. It is not our intention to frighten and terrify people. But scholars of Islam have a job to do. That if we do not let you know what is in the Quran and what the... The Messenger of Allah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam has spoken about, about events which are to come. If we don't do that, then people would probably curse us in the grave. Why didn't he tell us? <laughs> That's why we have this job to do. And I hope that you'll be patient with me while we deal with this subject. Nuclear war is coming. It is there in our eschatology eschatology means the study of the end time eschatology in arabic ilmu akhiru zaman zaman means time akhir means last ilmu akhiru zaman the knowledge of the last age or eschatology so in our Islamic eschatology, we have this great war. And the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam had a name for it. He called it the He called it the the Malhama. Malhama. Most people don't even know the word. Malhama. But in Christian and Jewish eschatology they have another name for it. They call it Armageddon, yes, it's the same. Uh, and this clearly has to be nuclear war or thermonuclear war. It cannot be conventional war. Why? In tomorrow's lecture, which is going to be fascinating, today we're looking at the political analysis of events from an Islamic perspective of events which are taking the world to nuclear war. And tomorrow we're looking at economic and monetary analysis of events which are taking the world to nuclear war. I know that this is hardly ever something that you'll hear in Trinidad. I know that. Um, but I hope that my audience will be patient with me today. Uh, there is a hadith of the Prophet والسلام, It is in Sahih Bukhari You may have heard of it No one has ever uh, Questioned the authenticity of this hadith The Prophet والسلام, prophesied Listen to it That the river Euphrates which passes through Iraq and then comes to the Arab Gulf 
that the river Euphrates, in Arabic, Furat, the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. And people will fight over that gold. And 99 out of every 100 would be killed. And each would be saying, I would be the one who would survive. But the Muslims must not touch that gold. I tell you, I have read this hadith for 20 years or more <laughs> before I could understand it. Before Allah in his kindness could allow me to understand it. There has never been a war in all of human history which took 99% of combatants, took their lives, they all died. This would be a unique war in human history, like no other war before. The only way you can kill 99 out of every 100 is if you use weapons of mass destruction. And the primary weapon today of mass destruction is nuclear weapons and thermonuclear weapons. Hmm? So the Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, prophesied nuclear war. And he said that the nuclear war will be fought over the mountain of gold. If you want to know <laughs> about the mountain of gold, you must come back tomorrow. So we have in our eschatology in Islam the same thing that the Christians have and the same thing that the Jews have of nuclear war coming, Armageddon or, or the Malhama. The subject of Akhirul Zaman or the end time is one in which Islam has more information, more knowledge than anyone else. We have the most comprehensive knowledge, the most authentic knowledge, the most up-to-date knowledge. We have it. The Christians and the Jews also have knowledge of Akhir Zaman, but it cannot match ours. It is the biggest mystery of this Ummah that although we have the most knowledge, we've not used it. <laughs> we've not been using it. We do not have scholars of Islam who are trained in Islamic eschatology. We don't have it. It is not taught in our institutions of learning. No, it's not. And so, uh, it is now an uphill task for us to catch up with those who came before us, the Christians and the Jews. Our Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam was walking and he met some of his companions sitting and he asked, what are you talking about? And they said, we're talking about Akhir Zaman, the signs of the last day. And then he said, and I guess you all know the hadith, he said the last day would not come until, and he mentioned how many? Ten. And these are known as the ten major signs. Good. And I believe that our Muslim community in Trinidad and Tobago are familiar with these ten. They're not given in the chronological order in which they will occur, no. Number one, Dajjal, Al-Masihud Dajjal. Dajjal who will seek to impersonate the true Messiah. Hmm? 
Al Masihu Dajjal. Number two, Gog and Magog, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Number three, the return of the son of Mary, Nabi Islam, the true Messiah. Number four, Dukhan, smoke. And the Quran says that one day the sky will be filled with that smoke. When we give an opinion as to when will that smoke come and what will that smoke be, you must never accept that opinion until you are convinced that it is correct. Is that fair? Good. My opinion, and Allah knows best, is that the smoke, the Arabic word is Dukhan, would be the mushroom clouds from the nuclear explosions. And uh, the Prophet said, the Prophet Islam said, there'll be a number of days when there'll be no sunlight. No sunlight. In Christian and Jewish eschatology, you find the same thing. That there'll be a number of days when there'll be no sunlight because the, the Dukhan will block off the sunlight. Number five, Dabbatul Ar, or the beast or the creature of the earth. Number six, that the sun would rise from the west. Number seven, eight, and nine, three earthquakes. But these are earthquakes in which the earth will sink down and swallow what it swallows. Sometimes they call sinkholes. One in the east, one in the west, and the third one in Arabia. And number 10, which is now on the top burner, number 10, that a fire will come out of Yemen and drive people to their place of assembly for judgment. Out of these 10, and of course there are many others, but they are not located in this hadith. Out of these 10, there's one which is the preeminent sign, the most important one of all, that everything else revolves around it. What is it? The Quran says, بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَإِنَّهُ it could also be read that he, Nabi Isa Islam, Jesus, his return. This is the sign of all signs of Akhir Zaman or the last stage. I gave a lecture at the State University of Moscow in uh, July of 2013. And the Russians were astonished when they heard this. Because Iran had been at work for many, many years, and Iran had presented to them a Shia version, which was different. For Iran, the major sign of Akhir zaman is the advent of Imam al-Mahdi. So when I went to Moscow, all they were talking about is Imam al-Mahdi, Imam al-Mahdi, Imam al-Mahdi. So when I took the Quran and I brought the Quran before them, I said, no, that's wrong. The major sign of Akhir zaman is the return of Nabi Isa Islam, Jesus, the true Messiah. And the most powerful voice in history to have prophesied the return of Jesus. And Mirza Ghulam Ahmad could do what he wants to do. He cannot silence that voice. The most powerful voice in history to have prophesied the return of Jesus, the son of Mary, is the voice of Muhammad. Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. This is the foundation of Islamic eschatology. If you reject this, you're wasting your time attending my lecture. <laughs> yes, you are wasting your time 
attending my lecture because this is the foundation stone of Islamic eschatology. There are two kinds of verses in the Quran. This is in Surah to Ali Imran, at the beginning of Surah to Ali Imran, which is the third Surah of the Quran. The, the Quran is comprised of two oceans of ayat. Ayat means verses. Two oceans of ayat in the Quran. The first is ayat muhkabat of verses which are plain and clear. All that you need for this is tafsir. Tafsir means to explain. And the Quran says that these are ummul kitab. This is the heart of the book. But the Quran also has a second ocean of ayat. What is it called? Ayat? Ayat mutashabihat. The first one, ayat muhkamat, plain and clear. The second one, ayat mutashabihat. And these are verses which have to be interpreted to get the meaning. The Arabic word is ta'wil. The first one is tafsir explanation and this one is ta'wil interpretation let me give you an example in the nights of ramadan eat and drink wakulu washrabu hatta yatabayyana lakum al khayt al abyad min al khayt al aswad min al fajr eat and drink until the white thread you know what thread you make kite you fly a kite huh? The white thread is distinct from the black thread of dawn. So white thread and black thread. All right. So one companion took a white thread and a black thread, put it underneath his pillow. And when the time came to start the fast, he took out the two thread and he's looking at them. And uh, he's having some difficulty in determining when to start the fasting. <laughs> so he went to the Prophet ﷺ, who very wisely did not interpret the ayah. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, no, 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 this does not mean literally the white thread and the black thread. No, this has to be interpreted and when Allah speaks of the white thread and the black thread Allah is speaking about the light of the day being distinct from the darkness of the night this is called ta'wil ta'wil Dajjal the false messiah who has to impersonate the true Messiah and get the Jews to believe that he is the true Messiah in, in Trinidad we say give them a six for a nine deceive them hmm? Dajjal if he is to successfully impersonate the true Messiah will have to rule the world from Jerusalem because when the true Messiah comes back, that is what he's going to do. He's going to rule the world from Jerusalem. Nabi Muhammad والسلام, said so, that he would be Hakim al Adil. Hakim, a ruler, Adil with justice. Hmm? So Dajjal has to rule the world. Is Dajjal is in the Quran? There are so many who dismiss the subject. They say, no, this is nonsense. This is not in the Quran. There is no mention of Dajjal in the Quran. It 
hurts me, of course, to have to utter these words. <laughs> but that's schoolboy scholarship. <laughs> that's not real scholarship. What you can say is that Dajjal is not to be found in the muhkamat of the Qur'an. But Dajjal is most certainly to be found in the mutashabihat of the Qur'an. Now that would be a more sensible statement. Uh, several ayat of the Qur'an, particularly in Surah Al-Kaf, which are directly linked to Dajjal. Nearly everything which pertains to Dajjal needs to be interpreted like the mountain of gold and we'll do that tomorrow inshallah the prophet said Islam, about Dajjal that when he is released released from what? he's on an island if you've read uh, <laughs> Jerusalem in the Quran I I wrote that book about how much, 14 years ago, <laughs> right? It was published about 13 years ago. If you read that book, you'll see the hadith. The Dajjal was on an island and he was in chains, okay? His hands were chained to his neck, his feet were chained and so on. And we don't have the time to go over that now. But when he's released, said the Prophet Islam, from that island, he will live on earth for how many days? Forty days. But when the Prophet uses the word forty, be careful. Because someone asked him which is the first masjid which was built. He said the Kaaba. And then they asked him which was the second masjid which was built. They said Masjid Al-Aqsa, Jerusalem. And then they asked him how many years, how many years were there between the construction of the two? He said 40. What did you do? A couple thousand years. <laughs> he said 40. So when he uses the word 40, do not understand it literally. This is Mutashar Bihar. The Jal will live on earth for 40 days. One day which would be like a year. One day which would be like a month. One day which would be like a week. And then all the rest of his days like your days. My book Jerusalem and the Quran was based on this hadith. I came to the conclusion that it was only when the Jal was in a day which is like our day, only then would we be able to see him. Because he's in our world of space and time. Prior to that, he's here on earth. But we can't see him. Are there angels in this room? Answer me. Yes, there are. Each one of us have two angels. Can we see them? No. Are there jinn in this room? Yes. Can we see them? No. So too with the job. In his day like a year, in his day like a month, in his day like a week, he's here but we cannot see him. Only when his day is like our day, at the end of his life then we will see him. And the Prophet said he will be a Jew, he will be a young man, he'll be powerfully built, and he'll have the curls that the Orthodox Jews have. Hmm? And from Jerusalem he'll declare, I am Al-Masih, the Messiah. And they'll accept him. They'll accept him. But before that, he's here on earth, but we cannot see him. I came to the conclusion that he had to pass through three stages of his mission before he would appear in person. And in stage one, what he did was to build and create a, a ruling state in the world, namely Britain. Britain. 
When I was a child, uh, we had to sing God Save the King, you know, in school. You know about that. We had to sing, sing God Save the King every morning before going to class. God Save the King. And then when I was 10 years of age, King George died. And then Elizabeth took over. We had to sing God Save the Queen. So Imran Hussein was singing God Save the Queen. <laughs> now, now I look back at those days. You didn't have nobody to tell us. What nonsense is this? God save the king, God save the queen. Britain became the ruling state in the world. It never happened before in history. And it, it became known as the age of Pax Britannica. You may have heard the term. Pax Britannica, for the first time in human history, meant that one state had the power to dominate the rest of the world and no combination of rivals could threaten that power. That was bitter. Hmm? And uh, tomorrow we will see that when Britain became the ruling state in the world, it was not only on the basis of military power, but also control over money, sterling pound. When we were at school, we had to learn one pound four eighty, two pound nine sixty. He's shaking his head. He's shaking his head. One pound four eighty, two pound nine sixty, three pound fourteen forty. Why? Because the, ster the sterling pound was the, His Majesty, the ruling money in the world. Hmm? Then I came to the conclusion that when the Jal moved to stage two, a day like a month, that the United States now replaced Britain as the ruling state in the world. And the United States did not become the ruling state based only on military power, but also on the basis of control over money. And so the British sterling pound had to give way for the US dollar to replace it. Hmm? Tomorrow's lecture is going to be fascinating for you on the monetary system. And when Dajjal's day, like a month, is coming to an end, which is where we are now. And a day, like a week, is about to commence. That the United States is going to give way to a third state. Which is going to become the new ruling state in the world. And in the same way that Pax Britannica gave way to Pax Americana, so too will Pax Americana give way to Pax Judaica, and Israel will become the ruling state. This is where we are now. The question, however, is, the United States is so big, and the world has grown so big in these last 100 years. Population is expanding dramatically. How can little Israel rule a big, 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 big world like this? Not possible. Either Israel has to expand and become big like the United States, to rule the world, which is not possible. Why? Because Israel is located in a sea of Islam. <laughs> All around is Muslims. Or the second possibility is that the world has to become smaller. Which one will it be? Will Israel expand and become so big or will the world contract and become smaller? What does the Quran have to say? 
The verse is in Suratul Isra, Surah number 17 of the Quran. And listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to say. This is Ilmu Akhirul Zaman or the study of the end time. And there is not a single town or city that will escape. But we will destroy them all. This is the Quran. This is not Hadith. This is Quran. There is not a single town or city that will escape. But we will destroy them all before Qiyamah. And those which escape destruction will be Punish with severe punishment. And this is something inscribed in the book. This verse of the Quran is warning us of great destruction that is to come to the world. There are other verses of the Quran, but we don't have the time to turn to them on the Malhama. And then there are the Ahadiths which speak very specifically, like that one which says that 99 out of every 100 would be killed. Hmm? We are now located at that moment in time when a day which is like a month is coming to an end and a day which is like a week is about to begin. If we go back now to that moment when Pax Britannica was giving way to Pax Americana, there were big wars in the world. They call it the First World War. They call it the Second World War. That's the name they have for it. For me, they were European wars, not world wars. But these were wars in which the world experienced destruction like never before in history. I was born when the Second World War was taking place. Yeah. Um, millions and millions of people were killed, particularly Europeans in those world wars. So in order for Israel to replace the United States of America as the ruling state in the world, you don't need a PhD to know that not only does Israel have to take over from the US dollar, and new money has to come that Israel will control, but also there will be great wars. Who will the wars be fought against? There are two forces in the world, two, which stand up to resist Israel. Who are they? Number one, the followers of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Those whose Qibla are in Makkah. Because, forgive me for saying so, don't be annoyed with me. We have people who Qibla in Washington. Forgive me for saying so. Don't be annoyed with me for saying so. There are people who prefer, prefer to hold on to the U.S. visa than to be faithful to Islam. My U.S. visa is more important to me than being faithful to Allah and Islam. Forgive me, please forgive me, but I have a job to do. The big war which is coming will attack Muslims, 
because they are the ones who are standing up to Israel. And another people are standing up to Israel. Who are the other people? The answer is to be found in Surah Al-Ma'idah. And this is the most important ayah I'm quoting today. So listen carefully. Surah Al-Ma'idah, which is the fifth surah of the Quran. <coughs> Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns of a time which is to come in which he says Latajidanna you will most certainly find in time to come Ashaddan nasi adawatan lillazina amanu al-yahud that the Jews will become the people with the greatest hatred and hostility and enmity for you. That time will come. وَالَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا That in addition to the Jews, there will be another people who will display the same hatred and enmity and hostility for you. And they will be a people whose total agenda is shirk. Everything connected with them is shirk. Example? Shall I give you the example? You don't mind. Well, Allah speaks in the Quran about Yawmul Jum'ah. Yawmul Jum'ah. إِذَا نُونِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ فَسَعَوْا إِلَى ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَذَرُوا الْبَعِي When the call to prayer is made on the day of Jum'ah, give up! Shut your business down and go to the masjid. Hmm? Juma, Yomul Juma, the day of Juma. This is the name that Allah has given in the Quran, Yomul Juma. They changed that name and they've given a new name. And the new name is Friday. In the English language, in Friday, in French is Vendredi. In Spanish, what is in Spanish? Anybody know Spanish? Viernes. Huh? Viernes. Friday, check it out, huh? Is the day for the worship of Fry. F R E I. Uh, who is Fry? <laughs> it's a Scandinavian goddess. The day for the worship of a Scandinavian goddess. The days of the week like that, the months of the year like that. January, February, March, all that stuff. So you are going to be attacked by two people. The Jews and another people whose agenda will be con constantly shirk. And at that time when this manifests itself in the world, at that time, وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ Mawaddatan lilladhina amalu lilladhina qalu inna nasara That at that time when the Jews become most hostile of all to you I'm sorry to have to be repeating again and again And when these people, this civilization of shirk is hostile to you, waging war on you At that time you will find that those who will be closest in love and affection for you would be a people who say we are Christians Allah didn't stop there he went on to tell us something more about the people who which Christians are these ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ مِنْهُمُ الْكِسِّسِينَ وَرُهْبَانَ وَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ This is because these Christians are people who have monasticism. The monastery, the monk, the monastic way of life. And because they are not an arrogant people. They are not an arrogant people. They don't want to rule the world. 
They don't want to transform all of mankind into carbon copies of themselves. If I have a curry chicken and rice in front of me, curry chicken and rice, and I wash my hands, and I roll up my sleeve, and I start to eat my curry chicken and rice with the cutlery that Allah gave me, the fingers. These arrogant people will say that is an uncivilized way of eating. No. Civilized people don't eat like that. <laughs> and my response to them is, you can take your civilization and throw it in the Red Sea. I don't care a fig leaf. Sorry for raising my voice. I don't care a fig leaf for you and your views. It is arrogance on your part, arrogance on your part, that you want to transform me into a carbon copy of yourself? That I had to put on jacket and tie eh, to be civilized, to be in respectable company? Jacket and tie? In the Caribbean? In this heat? Eh? In this heat, tropical climate? And you see the fellow in suit and jacket and tie? May you should send him some. <laughs> it's a madhouse. This is for my audience outside of Trinidad. So you have a people who have arrogance in them. That they want you to live the way they live. They want you to be transformed into carbon copies of themselves. But these Christians who will be closest in love and affection for you Muslims are not an arrogant people. They don't have the agenda of ruling the world. And they don't have the agenda of transforming people into carbon copies of themselves. So which Christians are they who are holding on to this day to monasticism? the monastery and the monastic way of life, the monks. Answer, we have Abdul Qadir here to answer you. He was Orthodox Christian. The Christian world has two parts. One is that part of the Christian world which celebrates Christmas on the 25th of December. And then you have the other part of the Christian world which celebrates Christmas on 7th or 9th? 7th of January. 7th of January. That other part is called Orthodox Christianity. And this part is called Western Christianity. But I call it, this is the only part of the world where you're not allowed to have a bed except one man, he's allowed to have a bed. Everybody else must shave off the bed. You can't be in the police service and have a bed. No. You can't be in the armed forces and have a bed. You can't work in a hotel with a bed. No. But this fellow is allowed to keep his bed. And he comes once a year, flying on a reindeer. <laughs> flying on a reindeer, once a year. So this is Santa Claus Christianity. The Orthodox world don't have this Santa Claus Christianity. When I went to Russia, I found so many people with beards. Yeah, Orthodox Christians with beards. So Orthodox Christianity also has monasticism. Russia is the leader of Orthodox Christian world, Russia. And I found so many beards in Russia. My host who invited me to the State University of Moscow was Professor Alexander Dugin. And Alexander Dugin had a big beard <laughs> sitting next to me. <coughs> the two people who are going to be a threat to Israel are Muslims and Orthodox Christians. 
Do we find Orthodox Christians in the Quran? Yes. There's a whole surah. It's known as Surah to? Surah to? Room. Surah to Room. Surah number 31, perhaps. And look how it begins. Ba'da'uzu billahi min shaitani rajim alif la mim. Ghulibatil Room. Room has been defeated. Fi adnal ard in a land close by. So a battle took place at the time when the Quran was revealed and there was no Washington at that time and there was no need to at that time so we can dismiss that nonsense a battle took place at the time when the Quran was being revealed and Rome was defeated in a land close by close to Arabia but Allah is prophesying he is saying that the tables are going to be turned. In just a few years' time, Room is going to be victorious. On that day when Room is victorious, the Muslims are going to celebrate. The Muslims are going to celebrate when Rome is victorious. Who is Rome? Rome is the Orthodox Christians who had the Byzantine Empire in Constantinople. And today, Russia is the leader of Rome. Greece is also in Rome, Armenia is in Rome, Bulgaria is in Rome, and so on. The reason why nuclear war is coming is because in the world of Islam, there's only one Muslim country with nuclear power, Pakistan. But Pakistan is a little lightweight, <laughs> lightweight. But Rome is also a major power because Russia is a nuclear power. And uh, Israel cannot succeed the United States and become the new ruling state in the world unless and until Pakistan submits to Israel and Russia submits to Israel. Huh? The way today Pakistan is submitting to the United States and to Saudi Arabia, the government of Pakistan. We have a Pakistani here. <laughs> but the people of Pakistan are not prepared to submit to Israel. When uh, Saudi Arabia attacked Yemen, was it two weeks ago? Saudi Arabia led an alliance and took with her Abu Dhabi, um, UAE, and um, Egypt joined in this one. And Saudi Arabia made a formal request to Pakistan to join in the attack on Yemen. Saudi Arabia, the richest country in the region, and Yemen, the poorest country in the region. The richest has launched an attack on the poorest of all. The government of Pakistan is a shoeshine boy of the Saudis. That's what Nawaz Sharif is. A shoeshine boy of the Saudis. And this lecture is being recorded. It's going to be on YouTube. And they're going to listen to it in Pakistan. The government of Pakistan is a shoeshine boy of the Saudis. And the Pakistan armed forces are also led by shoeshine boys who will sell themselves for U.S. dollars. The Kibla is in Washington. I make no apologies for this language of mine. No. Somebody has to speak out. But if Pakistan joins the attack on, Iran, on Yemen, what will be the implications next door with Iran? <laughs> 
because Pakistan is already facing a hostile India on this side and you now face a hostile Iran on that side. So the shoeshine boys in the government of Pakistan decided to put the matter before the National Assembly, let them decide. The Saudis, of course, were furious. The National Assembly debated the issue and unanimously rejected the Saudi demand. Unanimous. Hmm? So the people of Pakistan are hostile to, to Israel. But the government of Pakistan always betraying them. In the case of Russia, it's different. In the case of Russia, what they did was the Jews, the Russian Jews, were the ones who you would not know about this, this is history, the Bolshevik Revolution. And then they brought something called communism and the Soviet Union. But this was done by the Russian Jews. Yes. And they created the Soviet Union to destroy Orthodox Christianity. And thousands and thousands of Christian monks and priests were killed. Monasteries were shut down by the Soviet Union to try to destroy Orthodox Christianity. They brought an atheist state to the Soviet Union. But they planned their plan and it didn't succeed. And when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1988 to 89, somewhere around there, since then, Russia has been returning to Orthodox Christianity. The, it's not complete yet. It's still being, it's still a return is still coming. And as Russia returns to Orthodox Christianity, Russia refuses to bow to the Zionists, refuses to bow to Washington. And that is why they'll have to wage war on Russia and on Pakistan so that Russia does not survive as a nuclear state and Pakistan does not survive as a nuclear state. I was attending a conference in Tehran in Iran in September, last September. Conference of independent thinkers. And I had a dream while sleeping. And the dream was repeated twice in the same night. I normally don't reveal my dreams in public. No. But this one, I said, no, I have to. I have to reveal it to the people. I saw nuclear war. I saw nuclear missiles being shot into the sky. Nuclear war. And I saw that Pakistan was a part of the war. When I woke up from my sleep, I then remembered the two years prior to 9-11, I had a dream. I was Imam at Masjid Darul Quran in Long Island. And in that dream, I saw balls of fire coming down from the sky on Manhattan skyscrapers. And these balls of fire were jumping from one building to another, jumping and then jumping out of Manhattan and spreading all over the world. The next Juma that came, I gave a khutbah. And in that khutbah, I mentioned this dream. I mentioned it in the khutbah. Two years later, 9-11, and I immediately recognized this is a dream I saw. So since there was an interval of two years between the dream and 9-11, I came to the conclusion, you don't have to accept my conclusion, that we have a period of about two years from September last, before the nuclear war comes. Why so quickly? Now we turn to Russia's tryst with destiny. Russia is not prepared to bend her knee. No. 
Russia is defying them. Russia says, you want war? We'll give you war. <coughs> but they had a master plan for Russia that I was explaining to our chairman earlier. That in the Quran, in Surah Al-Kaf, Zulkarnain, Zulkarnain means the one who possesses two karn. Karn can mean horn, or karn can mean age. Two horns or two ages, Zulkarnain, Surah Al-Kaf. You do recite Surah Al-Kaf, don't you? Come on, shake your heads. <laughs> but everywhere in the Quran that Allah uses the word karn, he always uses it to mean age and he never uses it to mean horn. So Zulkarnain is someone whose story impacts on two ages. He has power. Allah gave him power and he has faith. Hmm? And he travels to the east, sorry, he travels to the setting of the sun, west. And there he comes across Ainun Hamia, a body of water which was dark and murky. And there he met a people and Allah says, what are you going to do with them? And he replies and says, those who have been guilty of acts of zulum, oppression, Wickedness, I am going to punish them. And when I am finished with them, you will, all, you will punish them. So power will be used to punish the oppressor. On that first age. And those who have faith and who are righteous in their conduct, I will treat them nicely and reward them. Then of course he traveled in the direction of the rising of the sun, you remember? And then the third journey to the pass between the two mountains, the Gog and Magog. But this body of dark and murky water, the tafsir of the Quran are all unanimous, it is the Black Sea. And if you know your geography, there's the Mediterranean Sea. You did a school, you did go to school, didn't you? The Mediterranean Sea. And above the Mediterranean Sea is the Black Sea. The Black Sea. And Russia has no other place to have a naval port with warm water other than the Black Sea. Because the north of Russia is, is ice, blocked up with ice. So if Russia is to have a navy, Russia needs the Black Sea. And if Russia is to ever pose a threat to Israel and the Zionists, the Black Sea is of crucial importance. After the Malhama, it is most likely that we'll no longer have any electronic warfare, aerial warfare and so on, after the Malhama. Because nuclear war is nuclear war. So after the Malhama, wars are going to be fought on land and on the sea. And so, the threat to Israel, when Israel takes over from the United States, the threat to Israel will be number one from Pakistan and the nuclear weapon, and number two, Russia, naval war, more than land war, naval war. So the Black Sea offers strategic importance for Israel, for the security of Israel. So what they did was, in the Black Sea, you have a peninsula jutting out into the Black Sea. It's called, anybody help me? Crimea is correct. You're doing some geography, huh? Crimea is correct. And whoever controls Crimea controls the Black Sea. Oh, yes. So Crimea was Russian territory. So the plan was, the master plan was, you create this Soviet Union, communist state, and then in 1954, six years after Israel was born, 
Nikita Khrushchev transferred the territory of Crimea from Russia to Ukraine without the permission of the Russian people, without the permission of the Crimean people. And Crimea became part of Ukraine. But since the Soviet Union controlled both Russia and Ukraine, it's not a problem yet. The problem would come when the Zionists use the color revolutions to cause the collapse of the Soviet Union. They needed the Soviet Union to collapse. Why? So that Ukraine will emerge as an independent state. And Russia will emerge as a federation. And Crimea will belong to Ukraine. Okay? Then the next part of the strategy was to get a pro-Western government in Ukraine. And when you install a pro-Western government in Ukraine, then Ukraine will apply to become a member of NATO. And when Ukraine is a member of NATO, that's Russia's goose is cooked. Because Ukraine will say to Russia, get out of Crimea. Russia doesn't have a naval port anymore. And Israel is now safe. So what they did about a year ago, December, they had these street demonstrations and so on. And uh, they were able to bring about a change in government. And a pro-Western government came to Ukraine. As soon as that happened, Russia acted swiftly, so swiftly, they took the Western world by surprise. Russia turned to the Crimean parliament. The parliament of Crimea debated the subject and the Crimean parliament adopted a resolution unanimously that Crimea wants to return to Russia. As soon as that resolution was adopted in the Crimean parliament, the Russian parliament then met and accepted Crimea back into Russia. And it became part of law. It happened within two weeks. This is the biggest blow that the Zionist movement has ever experienced in its history. Why? Because now that Russia has Crimea, and Russia is now a nuclear power, 100 years ago it was not. Russia now commands the whole Black Sea. And all the states, including Turkey, got to think twice now. The strategic environment has changed dramatically. The longer they wait to attack Russia, the stronger will Russia become. <laughs> that is why a period of one or two years makes sense. That if they wait longer than that, Russia will become stronger and stronger. Will Russia back down from nuclear war? No. Russia is not prepared to back down. And so nuclear war is coming. And it is Russia's destiny to stand up to the oppressor and use power to punish the oppressor. Because Zul Karnain did it the first time. And Karnain means two ages. So in the same part of the world where he did it the first time, in the second age, Karnain, two ages, it will come to pass again. This is Surah al -Kaf. This is how Surah al -Kaf of the Quran anticipates for us the big war which is coming in which Russia is going to use her power to seek to punish the oppressor. Tomorrow, inshallah, we will look at the subject from a different perspective. Namely, in addition to threatening Russia with nuclear war, 
they are attacking Russia in a different way. They are attacking the Russian ruble. When I arrived in Moscow, July 2013, 33 Russian rubles were equivalent to one US dollar. 33 to one. After Russia took Crimea, and Russia says, I'm not going to give back Crimea. No, you can do what you want. They began to attack the Russian ruble. The price of oil suddenly started to drop mysteriously. It had nothing to do with economics, only politics. <laughs> and the Russian ruble is losing value, losing value, losing value. Hmm? So they're attacking Russia with economic weapons and monetary weapons. And tomorrow's lecture will deal, will deal with that hadith about the mountain of gold. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless us with the knowledge to be able to respond to this big war which is coming. What to do? How do we prepare for a big war? What kind of world is it going to be when nuclear war takes place? Again, it is Surat al kaf that you have to flee out of the cities. Flee out of the cities. Get out of the cities. Because the cities are going to be destroyed. A city with 20 million people. Those who die in the war are the lucky ones. Those who survive are the unlucky ones. Why? Because the city of 20 people, 20 million people cannot feed itself. No. The food has to come from outside. And the line of communication and supply are going to be disrupted. So when 20 million people, or what is left of 20 million people, want food, they're hungry, they want water, they have no water. And this frantic search for food and water turns violent. You wouldn't want to be there at that time. This is what Surah to Isra is talking about. That those towns and cities which are not destroyed will punish them with terrible, terrible punishment. So before we end, Surah al kaf of the Quran is telling us that the, the way to respond to the nuclear war that is coming is to seek security in the remote countryside. Stock up on food and stock up on water and continue to make dua to Allah. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samir alim wa tuba alayna ya mawlana inna ka anta tawab rahim. برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين